welcome everyone. We are very, very excited that you are here with us today and tomorrow. You are among some of the biggest fans of parent-child interaction therapy, and we hope that we are among some of the biggest fans in the making of PCIT. Um, as it was mentioned, we are being filmed, so if you don't mind holding any questions until the end of each of the sessions, that would be wonderful. Uh, and my name is Melanie Fernandez, and I am a clinical child and adolescent psychologist and a master trainer in PCIT, and I love this program, and I'm gonna allow my colleagues to introduce themselves now to tell you why they love this program. Dr. Rhea Chase. So I'm Rhea Chase, and I am also a PCIT uh, master trainer. I currently work at Duke University at the Center for Child and Family Health, and my primary position is to work on a PCIT dissemination project and we work on a PCIT learning collaborative, which is a training methodology specifically designed to disseminate PCIT to community agencies where maybe the service typically wouldn't be available. Um, I also serve on the PCIT International Training Task Force and the um, Board of Directors. So basically, I am like all PCIT all the time, <laughs> and I love it. I consider myself very, very lucky. And I love it because PCIT is so incredibly rewarding as a treatment program. You see real tangible change in the parent-child interaction, in the parent's behavior, and in the child's behavior in front of your eyes. So you certainly see positive changes throughout treatment, but I'm talking you see change in an hour. In like 30 minutes you can see positive changes because I think that live coaching and we're providing parents support in the moment and shaping their behaviors in the moment. So you can see very rapid change. And one of my trainees actually, I think she said it really well on a consultation call last week. She said, you know, my kiddo came in, mom had just woken him up from a nap. So he was whiny and he didn't want to come into the therapy room and he was crying. And, but we coached mom through it. She did a wonderful job and they left smiling and happy. She's like, and I realized I am the only therapist in my agency where a kid comes to me unhappy and they leave happy. So I thought that that summed it up really nicely. Yeah, and, and I like that for the parent too, because often the parent yes. will come in unhappy yes. and leave happy, <laughs> uh, which is a really remarkable thing. Hi, I'm Melody Nelson, and I'm from the ADHD Center in Lake City, Florida, and also the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And, and the, the part that I love about PCIT is I expected the child to be different. You know, it's, it's child therapy, but I think I underestimated how much change takes place for the parent and how really dramatic that change can be from the beginning of treatment to the end of treatment. You know, a lot of our families, they come in and and they are worn out by their kids. They, some have even told me, you know, I honestly try and avoid them as much as I can. I wait until daycare is closing before I pick them up. I drop them off the minute they open, um, you know, just because they are overwhelmed by their kids. And, and I think that the first time I was hooked on PCIT was at, at a graduation session with a parent. And she said, you know, when I came in here, I loved my kid, but I didn't like him at all. Um, now I want to spend every day with him and I just love the time that we share together and and from that moment on I was most definitely hooked but I really love how it, it really affects parents and also the other the other kids in the home really see a big difference too if nothing else mom and dad aren't completely consumed with the child that's acting out so much they're able to spend more time and more quality time and more pleasant time there's not so much yelling in the house all those things make for a much better whole family environment not just the impact on the on the child Right, and to, to add on that, so I'm, I'm Dan Bagner. I'm coming all the way from upstairs. Uh, <laughs> I am, uh, I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Psychology at the Center for Children and Families. Um, and just to add on to what Ray and Melanie are saying, um, you know, this change that we see in families, there's incredible amount of empirical support for this treatment. So it's not just we're all saying this works and it's really great. Um, and I'll be highlighting some of the research that we've done already. Um, and there's a lot of exciting research that's going to be taking place, but the effect of PCIT, when we look at the numbers, is huge. Um, we have huge effect sizes, um, lots of studies demonstrating s empirical support for this treatment. Um, and in addition to all the research, um, we also, as a good PCIT therapist, 
when you leave this, hopefully you'll, you'll consider new tra other trainings to become certified PCIT therapist. A good therapist um, is a good researcher because when you're conducting PCIT, you are collecting data weekly with families or every time you see the family, you're collecting data about the child's behavior, you're collecting data about um, the, the parent's skills, the parent's relationship with the child, and you see that change visually on graphs and with numbers. So it's, it's pretty remarkable both from the standpoint within each family and also then the bigger, larger um, research world showing support for this treatment. All right. And just to grow there, my name is uh, Dr. John Paul Abner, and I'm an associate professor at a tiny little school known as Milligan College. And I uh, also work at the East Tennessee Center of Excellence for Children in State Custody, training therapists in parent-child interaction therapy. I, uh, you know, y'all mentioned some excellent reasons why y'all love PCIT. You know, the impact it has upon the children, the, the impact it has upon the parents, just the solid core of research that's behind this. The reason why I love PCIT is very simple. It's fun. It is so much fun to do PCIT. Now, part of the fun is because of the impact it is having on the children and the families. You get to see just miracles in the making as kids go from uh, kids who just have a very difficult time obeying parents and self-regulating their emotions to kids who are just enjoying their parents and enjoying themselves. And you get to, uh, you go from parents who are just struggling as parents to parents who feel incredibly confident in what they are doing and who have a strong love for their kids. And to watch that, it's just fun. <laughs> and I am a, uh, you know, I'm a therapist, but I'm also a teacher. And PCIT really gives me a chance to combine both of those skills because there is not only therapy going on in PCIT, there's a fair amount of teaching, there's a fair amount of coaching, and it's just a blast. Uh, I, you laugh a lot in PCIT. Mm -hmm. uh, you laugh with your parents, you laugh with your children, and it's just a lot of fun. So that's my incredibly deep reason <laughs> for, for being a PCIT fan. Thanks for sharing your reasons, everybody. So it wouldn't be a PCIT workshop if we didn't start off with some labeled praises, some acknowledgments, <laughs> and thanks. So of course, we are very appreciative and grateful to Dr. Sheila Iberg, the developer of PCIT, and Beverly Funderburg, the PCIT International Board of Directors, the Society for Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology, putting this on, the Center for Children and Families at FIU uh, for hosting, and Dr. Pelham and Tuma for all of the support and coordination. Um, we are grateful for all of it. So without further ado, we'll get you started on the path towards becoming a PCIT therapist. You'll hear much more later about the sort of steps involved um, and when you hear about the training guidelines and requirements, but um, you're here for the first step, and that's exciting. And so I'm going to turn this over to, uh, oh, and I should say, we do not benefit financially from the sales of materials by PCIT International. So that's our disclosure, and Dr. Melanie Nelson will be presenting an overview of PCIT. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. And my pleasure to provide you with an overview. So what my goal is for the next um, bit of time is to kind of run through what PCIT is and why it's important, why it's, why it's so much fun, like Dr. Evner was talking about, um, and give you an idea. All of these concepts are things that we're going to go into in more detail as we go on. So hopefully you will have lots of questions at the end of this presentation, and hopefully those questions will be answered as we continue. So what is this parent-child interaction therapy or PCIT that we've been talking about? In most simplest terms, it's an empirically supported treatment for young children with disruptive behavior. That's what it is. Um, and it was developed by Dr. Sheila Iberg, like Melanie, uh, Dr. Fernandez mentioned a minute ago. Um, <clears throat> And the, the things that are most associated with are the, the empirical evidence that we have for it that shows that there's significant reductions in noncompliance and behavior problems. There is generalization both in the home setting and at school. Um, and for, the, uh, for most families, um, when we looked at them, um, I say we, <laughs> the, the PCIT uh, uh, 
uh, community. When it's been looked at um, three to six years later, the majority of those families are still doing well and their child's behavior is still within normal limits. So that's really outstanding information to have. Um, we also know that it generalizes to untreated siblings. It's a family therapy. It's not that you have um, the impact is only on one child in the family. You're going to have an impact on that whole family and, and the other children as well. Um, and it really changes the parent's interactional style. Um, and so that um, is kind of one of the, the core features of PCIT. How does it work exactly? What are the nuts and bolts of PCIT? I think that it's helpful to kind of see what is it the PCIT therapists do so that we can then talk about how that all uh, uh, comes about. The, the main goal of PCIT is to balance these two factors. One is you want to have a positive interaction with the child. You're increasing the amount of positive attention they get for good behaviors and decreasing the negative attention they get for bad behaviors. We know that for a lot of the kids that we see that have disruptive behavior, that's gotten all mixed up, where kids are getting lots of attention for negative behaviors, and then when they're being good, their parents are like, oh, thank gosh, <laughs> you know, and, and leave them alone, where we want the opposite to be the case. We want them to be getting lots of attention when they're behaving well and less attention when they're behaving badly. Um, and then the other factor that we want to put in there is consistent limit setting, uh, where parents learn to be consistent and predictable in their discipline strategies and follow through. And that can also be really challenging when kids have disruptive behavior, because parents, quite honestly, are often fed up to hear. <laughs> and when they are, they're not making necessarily the best parenting decisions in the moment. You know, if they're fed up to hear and the child spills their milk, they are more likely to fly off the handle, whereas if they're not necessarily that frustrated with the child, they can handle that in a more appropriate manner. Okay. So what we're trying to, to achieve with all the families is getting a nice balance of those two things. Parents that can have positive interactions with their child and use attention appropriately and set appropriate limits with their child as well. And, and PCAT generally starts with a pretreatment assessment, like most therapies, right? Um, where we get lots of good information about the family, and we'll talk more about what that entails. And then, for, uh, on average, PCIT lasts about 14 to 16 weeks um, with a session each week. Um, and like uh, Dr. Bagner mentioned, we assess the families regularly. Every week, we find out about the child's behavior, and we find about, out about the parent's behavior. Um, and so the, the, um, each phase, each of those two factors that we're balancing corresponds to a phase of treatment. And in each phase, there's a, a one session that's devoted to uh, teaching or to didactics, where we explain to the parents the sorts of skills that we want them to learn in that phase. And then after that, it's followed with coaching uh, uh, sessions, where the family comes in with the child, and they participate together. And the therapist is there to coach and, and help um, and provide a lot of support. Um, and uh, so. You have a teaching session and then a coaching session and then they move on to the next phase and there's another teaching session and then more coaching sessions until they graduate from treatment. Um, and when we move on to the limit setting component, there's a, uh, a careful plan for generalizing those skills from first in the clinic with the therapist there to a little bit at home, to a little more at home, to all the time at home and then ultimately to um, public situations. And so it's very carefully kind of rolled out so that families uh, are more likely to be successful. Um, and then at the end of treatment, there's a post-treatment assessment um, to kind of uh, uh, wrap things up, but also to, to be able to show the parents the, the demonstrable change that's happened. Uh, we can show them the numbers that go along with it, but most of the time we can also just show the, the complete difference in how their child is reacting to them and how they are reacting to their child. So just briefly, the preclinical assessment, um, usually we'll do an interview, there'll be some screening measures, and a lot of this is at the discretion of the clinician. It would be whatever you would normally do for a brand new family that you're seeing. Um, the only big difference is that um, we also include a direct observation of the parent and child interacting together. Um, and that's a structured uh, observation. Um, it's called the Dyadic Parent-Child Interaction Coding System. We'll be talking more about that later. You can look forward to it. Um, and uh, so that gives us a, a different level of information um, than just getting questionnaires and things like that from the parent. We can actually see what they're like together. Okay. So the first phase of PCIT is, is called the child-directed interaction. And the goal there is really to work on that positive interaction between the parent and child to enhance that relationship and really maximize that attachment. Um, 
And so the, the goal is, is to reduce the frustration and anger that the parent feels with the child. I'll tell parents a lot of times, you know, right now I realize that it is probably hard to spend, you know, any time with him, even just to have fun, because he's, he's giving you so much uh, difficulty. Um, but I want you to be able to enjoy him. I want you to be able to have fun with him. And so that's part of what we're going to do here is get you guys to a point where you guys can be in the same room and have a good time together. Um, and then we'll, we'll worry more about the, the negative behavior as well. Um, the, and, I, and the initial goal of CDI is, is really to do that, is to change that relationship between the parent and the child to where they're enjoying each other. They get along well. The child likes the parent. The parent likes the child. But what we've also found is that there's a number of, I almost call them side effects. There's other things that happen during CDI that are wonderful um, that may not be necessarily our intention, but um, it does a lot for kids' social skills. Just being able to sit there and play nicely with their parent can help them learn to play nicely with other kids. Um, and, and that can be a great benefit, especially, again, we're working with kids that have disruptive behavior. Sometimes they're not very socially keen, and, and sometimes they're even disliked by other kids because they get in trouble so much. Um, so to give them some better social skills can go a long way towards helping their behavior, not just at home, but other places as well. Um, improving self-esteem. Um, again, our kids are in trouble a lot, and what do they hear? They hear, no, you're bad, you're in trouble, I can't believe you did that. All of those messages all the time. So this gives them a chance to kind of rebuild that self-esteem a little bit more so that they don't come to view themselves as a bad kid um, and, and they realize what a great kid they are. Um, it also has impact in terms of kids' organization and attention and staying on task. I've had lots of families who, when I explain to them what I want them to do, they say, there's no way he's going to sit in a chair <laughs> and play with me for any length of time. He just doesn't sit still. He doesn't sit still to eat. He doesn't sit still to do anything. Um, and slowly but surely, using the skills that we teach parents, we see that kids are, are able to sit and to attend for longer and longer periods of time. Um, and so that can be really dramatic um, for some families. Um, and for other families, the difference in speech and language skills can make a big difference. We're working a lot with young kids, and so sometimes they don't have the clearest uh, speech patterns, um, and they have uh, difficulties, or sometimes kids aren't necessarily progressing. They have language delays. And so the, the skills that we use, or we have parents use, um, can really help develop kids' speech and language skills over the same period of time. And we're also working on their disruptive behavior. We're giving them more social skills and helping with their self-esteem. There's a lot that goes on during CDI. The main rule of CDI is going to be to let the child lead the play. The child's in control. Um, and what we do is we have parents set up a special time. And during that special time, we instruct them in the do's and the don'ts of special time. And so we're, we're having parents do things differently in how they interact with their child. Um, we talk about tactical ignoring and, and when to give attention and when not to give attention. And we coach to criteria. So there is a end point that we are working for, okay? Um, the special time, we talk with parents about setting up a five minute special time with their child. Five minutes, five minutes is usually good. Um, it's not too much that most parents, most parents will say, yeah, I can do five minutes. If we said 30 minutes, no, I'm sorry. But five minutes, most parents are willing to work into their schedule. Um, but it's also enough time. I mean, the, the key there is that it really is enough time for kids to get the, the, the therapeutic effect of it, which is the, the wonderful thing, that we can do that in five minutes. Um, and the therapists really work with parents to problem solve. OK, when are you going to do this? Where are you going to do this? What sorts of toys are you going to use? Here's good ideas for toys to use. Here's not so good toys to use. Um, and we actually make parents in that first session commit, say, okay, tell me, what time are you going to practice? Where are you going to practice? What toys are you going to use to increase that, that um, motivation that they have to follow through on that and to increase the likelihood that they're going to do it at home? Um, and I, I often tell parents that without this five-minute special time happening at home, this isn't going to work. There's no way for PCIT to work if parents don't do it at home, okay? So this is, is, a, is a real critical uh, component to the, to the treatment. So the things that we ask parents to avoid really briefly, we're telling them not to lead the play. And so things that, that take away the lead from the child are going to be things like giving commands. And they're going to be asking questions. We'll take the lead away from the child. Um, and criticize. We want this to be a fun, enjoyable time. Obviously, if they're criticizing the child, it's not going to be so much fun. So um, we, want, we ask them to, to avoid criticizing. The things that we want them to do instead 
are things like praise their child, reflect what their child says, imitate what their child is doing, describe what their child is doing, and enjoy. Enjoy what the child is, is doing. And, and we call these the pride skills. You can see that they spell out pride. Um, and the idea is that by doing these things instead of the don't skills, it changes that interaction between the parent and the child. The child is now getting much more attention for their good behavior and much less attention for their, for their negative behavior. Um, and we talk specifically about ways to handle this behavior. Um, we talk about handling obnoxious, kind of annoying behavior, things that aren't dangerous or destructive, just things that we don't want them doing. Um, and we talk about uh, taking away attention or ignoring during that, that behavior, and then immediately returning attention as soon as the child re-engages in positive behaviors. Um, and we also talk with them about how to address uh, aggressive or destructive behavior should that happen during special time. It's really remarkable because it doesn't happen very often, even for kids that have a history of aggression and violence and, and really dramatic behavior during this special time they really do give their, their best behavior a lot of the time, and so you don't oftentimes see that aggressive or destructive behavior. Um, and we're working towards the mastery criteria. We have, very, like, we have actual numbers that we're working for to help us help parents get to that point where they're getting along really well with their child. The numbers are fabulous. It, it gives us a nice concrete way of telling parents what we're working for. It's not that we have to say, well, we just want your relationship to be a little warmer. Can you do that for me? It's, you know, we want to get you to the point where you're doing 10 label praises, 10 behavior descriptions, 10 uh, reflections, and less than three of the, the things that we don't want you to do. And parents understand that a whole lot better, and they can do that. And so if they're low on label praises, they know they need to work and get those higher. Um, so it's a really nice concrete way of helping us to get parents where we want them to be. And once they, they reach the mastery criteria for the child-directed interaction, then they're ready to move on to the, the parent-directed interaction. Um, and the parent-directed interaction is really the, the discipline and minding skills component of PCIT. That doesn't say, though, that there's no discipline and behavior modification going on in the first phase of treatment. I think that sometimes get, people get the wrong impressions, families that we're working with and, and um, sometimes um, others think that, oh, well, if you're just playing and you're providing positive attention, that you're not really changing behavior until you come through with limit setting. Um, and I would argue that there's a whole lot of behavior changes taking place during the child-directed interaction. Um, and so, um, it, plus the, the child-directed interaction, those skills, that relationship between the parent and the child that we're enhancing and developing really forms the cornerstone for making any form of limit setting more effective. Um, and particularly the PDI um, procedure that we'll talk about makes it more effective because the CDI had been there first. Um, so that being said, the things that we, we, we stress in PDI are giving good directions, how to give good directions to young kids that have disruptive behavior to make it more likely that they will comply and cooperate. Um, there needs to be contingent consequences. Um, and like I mentioned a little bit before, that, that there's that gradual generalization. It's not, okay, here's what I want you to do, go do it. Because um, that can be really challenging for kids that are acting out a lot of the time, for parents to all of a sudden come in and say, okay, I'm setting every limit that I need to right now. <laughs> That's a lot of work. And for most parents, what would happen? They'd probably get overwhelmed and they would give it up, right? So we do it slowly but surely and we build on success after success after success in terms of setting limits. And before they know it, they're able to set limits when they need to, where they need to. Um, and we also have planned responses. A lot of times parents will come to us and they'll say, oh, that'll never work with my kid. <laughs> and it probably hasn't worked for them uh, in the past. And, and what we do is, is we have planned responses for the things that have failed parents before. So a lot of times parents will say, timeout doesn't work, he just gets up and walks off. Okay, we have a response to that. <laughs> or, you know, oh, timeout doesn't work, he just laughs at me. Okay, we have a response for that. Or, you know, the, the, all of those things that, that happen. We also have planned responses to um, impulsive, destructive, dangerous behaviors that kids might be doing. Um, we have a special procedure for handling those. Um, and we talk specifically about handling kids' behavior in public because what happens is, you know, parents get to a point where they say, oh, I just want to be able to take them to the grocery store and not have it be an ordeal, right? Or, 
how I would wish we could go out for dinner as a family and have a nice meal. Um, we talk about that, and we get parents to a fact. And, and uh, uh, I already told the story, a graduation story, but another graduation story is that I had a family come to me, and they said that they had just taken their child out for dinner, and not only did their child not act out, they actually had an, an older couple that was dining there come over and compliment them on how well behaved their child was. And the mom was in tears as she was relaying this story. It just meant so much to her that they had gone from getting kicked out of restaurants to actually being complimented by, by strangers on how well behaved their child was. Um, so um, we, we have ways of, of dealing with that. Um, in the timeout procedure, in order for it to work for the kinds of kids that we work with, it's pretty regimented. I mean, we have answers for just about everything. So we talk with parents about what is timeout, what is not timeout. Um, we talk with them about where to set up their timeout, um, how long timeout should be, how to get them to timeout, what about staying in timeout or not staying in timeout, um, what backups that they might need to use if, if the child doesn't stay in timeout, and what to do after the timeout. Okay, so we cover the whole range. It's not just, I want you to put them in timeout and, and uh, let me know how that works. <laughs> I mean, we really go into it in, in great detail. Um, and the other thing is that we practice it with them. You know, in all of our coaching sessions during that phase, they are telling the kids to do things and setting limits with them and then following through with us there as support. And so, again, in the second phase, we're going to be working towards our mastery criteria. And, and so that means that we're working for um, parents to get to the point where they are giving commands effectively at least 75% of the time, if not more. So they're giving clear, direct commands that the child can understand and comply with. Um, and at least 75% of those should have correct follow through. So if the child does it, there should be a positive consequence. If the child does not do that, then they need to move forward with a, a discipline consequence. Okay. And so in terms of meeting graduation criteria, we have criteria for, for lots of things. But um, in terms of being ready to graduate, their CDI skills need to be at mastery levels. So if parents have kind of slacked off on that whole CDI thing now that they have limit setting in place, that's not going to fly. They need to still have their CDI skills at mastery levels. Their PDI skills need to be at mastery levels. Again, we're balancing those two factors, right? The relationship enhancement and the limit setting. We want both of them to be there in good measure. Um, the child's behavior must be rated as within a half a standard deviation of the mean. So we want them not just to be within normal limits, but within normal limits with a little bit of wiggle room, you know, so that if some of those behavior problems come back, they're still going to be within normal limits. They're not, you know, right on the verge of getting out of control again. Um, and the, the last criteria is that the, the caregivers really have to feel comfortable with using the skills. You know, they have to say, okay, I feel ready to do this on my own. Um, and I'll tell you, I've had families that each one of these things is a, is a sticking point for a different family. Um, you know, some pa parents have it down pat, you know, they, they can do it better than I can do it. Their child's behavior is angelic and they're just still a little bit hesitant <laughs> and not really ready to give up the support that they have in the therapy relationship. And so we work on that before they graduate or it might be that they have let those CDI skills slide and so we need to work on those to get those back up um, before they can meet all four of these criteria. So. Um, each one of these things can be a sticking point, but all four of them must be met for parents to, to truly graduate. And usually graduation is a fun session. We'll go over um, their progress. We can show them their numbers in terms of how they use the skills. We can show them how they rated their child's behavior. And usually we have our nice little graph that shows, oh, his behavior problems were way up here, and now they're way down here. Um, and that, that's wonderful. Um, and we give parents lots and lots of praise. We give parents lots and lots of praise throughout the process, obviously, um, which is really, really um, a remarkable tool because for most of the parents that come to see us, when they come to see us, they haven't been getting a lot of positive feedback on their parenting skills. And so any praise that we give them, I think, is really meaningful to them. Um, so it's nice to be able to, to give them more praise at graduation. Um, sometimes we'll schedule booster sessions or follow-up sessions. Um, you know, come back and see me in a month, um, and we'll see how things are going, especially for those parents who are a little hesitant to, to lose the therapeutic relationship. 
Um, or, you know, come and see me in three months and we'll just make sure. You know, sometimes if families graduate over the summer, I'll have them come back, you know, a month or so into school just to make sure that things are still going okay. Um, and we also talk with parents about how to manage future behavior problems. How do you use the skills that we've talked about with new behaviors? Um, and, and how do you generalize the skills that you're using very well with your child's current behaviors to new things that could pop up in the future? Okay. So a lot of what you, you've heard in PCIT, the setting up a special time, limit setting, um, praising, all of that, those are things that you'll, you might find in other parent training programs. They're pretty common, but there's a lot that makes PCIT really unique and, and really special and, and uh, why those of us that are here uh, today are really big fans of PCIT. Um, and so some of the things that, that make PCIT unique are the, are the core features. One is that active coaching of the parent with their child. It's, it's, it's a therapy that includes the parent and the child in just about every session. The teaching sessions, the parents come by themselves. Other than that, the child's coming with them each session. Um, and that's pretty unique. In, in um, other forms of therapy, either it's just the child is with the therapist or just the parent is with the therapist. This is one where there's both parent and child involved. Um, it's grounded in developmental theory. There's an emphasis on restructuring that interaction pattern. It's not just we're going to target this behavior and this behavior and this behavior. Um, it's very much assessment driven um, if you haven't gotten that message already. And, and it's not time limited. I, I mentioned earlier that it's an average of 14 to 16 weeks. But it depends on how long it takes for parents to meet that mastery criteria. Um, and we go as long as they need us to. Um, and it's very much empirically supported, like Dr. Wagner was talking about earlier. The, the support for it in terms of research and its, its clinical effectiveness is, is huge and gives us a lot of support for doing what we do. So coaching. Coaching is amazing. And I, I think that for people that haven't done coaching, it's, it's a little bit hard to understand the, the, rel the, the range of things that you can do within a coaching relationship. For one, you're there watching the parent interact with the child. You're watching them try and do the things that you've told them to do. So you know if they're doing it for right or for wrong, um, and you can help them uh, to, to do it the best way possible. Um, but it also gives you a much better understanding of that parent-child interaction. It's not filtered through the parent's report of what happened. And as you guys can imagine, you know, when parents come back and say, oh, I tried to do that and it didn't work because blah, 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 um, you know, it's hard to know what actually didn't work. When you're watching them interact with their child and it's not working, you can, as a coach, you can target what's not working and you can turn it around. And in, as you're turning it around, you're teaching the parent how to turn it around, which is really remarkable. Um, and you're changing that interaction. It's not that you're changing specific behaviors. It's not that you're getting rid of um, whining behavior or you're getting rid of um, aggression or things like that. Those things go away, but it's because you're changing the way that the parent interacts with the child. Um, it's not targeting those behavior problems specifically. Um, and so the, the interaction can work towards eliminating a lot of different negative behaviors, not just this one or this one or this one. Um, the coaching, what I love about it, is you're giving parents that specific, immediate feedback. Um, and honestly, a lot of our coaching is telling parents, good job. That was a great label praise there, a wonderful behavior description. That was the right thing to say right there. Um, and again, since they haven't been getting so much <laughs> positive feedback on what they've been doing, that is, is very motivating and very meaningful to, to a lot of the parents that we work with. Um, and you can correct those er errors immediately. As we all know, getting immediate feedback changes behavior a whole lot faster than delayed feedback. Okay? Um, and then you want that, that readiness to move on. Um, and so you want to know if, if they're able to do that. Um, what does it look like? It, <coughs> generally, the parent is in the room with the child. They have a bug in the ear, in their ear, that allows them to hear the coach. So the coach isn't, isn't in the room with them. Um, there's a two-way mirror, and behind that two-way mirror is the coach. Um, and they're able to coach them. So they're able to see everything that's going on, and they're able to talk to the parent. But they're not part of that interaction. Um, and for the most part, kids perceive it as, I'm playing with my mom, and the, the coach isn't even involved, um, which is really nice. Um, so the, the restructuring of the interactions, 
Um, here we're going to take a little trip back in history and kind of look at where PCIT came from and, and how it came to be. Um, if you can all go back to the early 1970s in Portland, Oregon, in your mind, <laughs> uh, imagine what it was like then. There were a couple big things that were going on then. One is behavioral parent training at the University of Oregon was a huge thing. Um, and its, main, sa its salient selling feature was that they were seeing huge reductions in child behavior problems. Wonderful success in terms of taking kids' behavior problems from very, very high to, to where we want them to be. Um, the other thing that was going on is play therapy. And play therapy was really popular. Um, you know, it, it felt good, children loved it, therapists loved it, but they weren't necessarily seeing those changes in the child's behavior that the behavioral parent training uh, was showing. Um, and there was some concern that the, the child would be bonding with the therapist rather than with the parent, okay? So that, those two big kind of uh, therapeutic approaches were going on. Um, the information or the, the research by Diana Baumrin was also coming into play, um, looking at what sorts of parenting uh, uh, strategies or approaches lead to the best outcomes. Um, and so her work finding that parents vary in degrees of their warmth in their interaction with their child and also their demandingness or, or ability to set limits. Um, and the kids that ended up having the best outcomes were the ones who had parents who were high in warmth and high in limit setting, and, and uh, Dr. Balmer labeled those authoritative parents. Um, and so there was some information there that we need parents to have both of those, um, both of those qualities. Um, and then also going on at the time, Constant Tomp was um, working with um, kids with developmental disabilities, and she actually had a, an oper operant program for them. But, but part of her program included that there, there were two phases to the treatment, as well as this coaching, um, this, this, this notion of working with parents as they are doing the things that we're training them to do to help them do it to the best of their abilities. Um, and so really all of these things, Dr. Iberg took all of this and kind of put it together into PCIT to change the interactions that parents are having with their kids, okay? Um, and in emphasizing those interaction patterns, like I was talking about a little bit, was changes, makes global improvements. Um, if you change how parents do things across the board, they're gonna be able to handle a lot more uh, behaviors than if you teach them, okay, for this behavior, do this, and now for this behavior, do that. They have skills that go across behaviors. Um, and really huge improvements in children's externalizing and internalizing symptoms, um, in child compliance, and huge differences in parents' stress, locus of control, feelings of depression, lots of difference for the parents as well. And, and it's all of those things that, that we believe go into why PCIT works so well as it does and works for a long period of time. Okay, it's also grounded in developmental theory. Um, I mentioned Baumrin briefly already, um, you know, the idea that nurturance and limits are both necessary for healthy outcomes for kids. Um, but PCIT really draws on attachment and social learning theories as well to achieve that authoritative parenting that we're going for. Um, you know, the primary goal of the child-directed interaction is to enhance that relationship, um, to improve that attachment between <laughs> parent and child. Um, that a lot of times is disrupted um, when kids have behavior problems. Um, and the parent is really shaping the child's behavior through differential social attention, right? They're giving positive attention when the child is behaving well, and they're removing attention when the child is misbehaving. <coughs> um, and so um, that really goes a lot to that social learning concept of, of how to um, affect kids' behavior. Um, because we know, you know, when we ignore, it needs to be complete ignoring. Any form of attention can uh, increase behaviors or prolong behaviors that we don't want to see. Um, and then when we move to PDI, that continues. The, the idea there is that timeout is a further removal of parent attention. Um, and so it's, it's almost like an, uh, a special form of ignoring. It's a, you know, extra strength ignoring or, or complete ignoring. Um, and PCIT really relies on parent attention as a, as a uh, reinforcer. It's a social reinforcer and that's what it uses, PCIT doesn't use material rewards or punishments um, 
you know, it's, it's not a matter of, you know, if you behave, then you get the piece of candy. It's, you know, based on you get your parents' attention, you get their smiles, and you get their hugs, and you get their um, uh, praise and everything else for good behaviors. Um, and then it's just neutral. Um, it's, it's not, you're not getting that attention when, when you're not behaving well. In terms of being assessment driven, um, the ECBI, the Iberg Child Behavior Inventory, is given each week, as is an observation of the parent skills using the dyadic parent child interaction coding system. Um, it allows us to guide the treatment goals. We know each week what we need to work on because we can see what the parent's good at and what they're struggling with. Um, we know when they are making progress in the right direction. We know if they're not making progress. Um, and we know when they've mastered it. We know when they're done. Um, and so that's really great information to have on a week by week basis. Um, the mastery criteria is always observable, measurable change, um, and, and uh, really concrete. But both of the, the CDI mastery criteria and the PDI mastery criteria are, are proxies. They're not the whole picture. You know, uh, we can have parents who meet the numbers, but they don't necessarily meet the spirit of, of the, the, the phase. Um, and so we want them to meet both of those things. But by and large, when parents are meeting the numbers part of it, they're also meeting the spirit part of it um, in terms of the attachment and the consistency and the predictability and the following through. Um, and again, just having this concrete information and really training parents to mastery helps keep them on track um, into the future. Um, in terms of being not time limited, I love this picture, it makes me smile every time. Um, treatment, really, treatment continues until families meet graduation criteria. Until their child's behavior is under control, they are masters at using the skills, and they feel comfortable with it. So every time a family graduates from treatment, they are successful, by definition. Um, it averages 14 to 16 weeks. It could be shorter. Not usually too much shorter, but um, it could be longer than that. It really depends on the families, and sometimes families have more, um, more needs and, and have a harder time uh, progressing through the treatment, and that's okay. Um, you know, I think that it's a matter of working with the families, and I think that it's a really great message for families too. It's not, you get five sessions with CDI and you're done, whether you are good at it or not, um, and you get five sessions with PDI and you're done, and what, because that, that would work for some families, but it probably wouldn't work for a lot of other families. And so the fact that it's not time limited is something I really appreciate, um, because I can work with families and get them all to a point. Um, to where they feel successful. And, and we want them to feel successful about their parenting. Again, when they feel good about it, they're gonna keep doing it, right? If they feel like, eh, I'm so-so with this, they might not continue once that therapy relationship is over either. So it makes a big difference. And then the fact that it's empirically supported, and, and Dr. Wagner has a lot more information on this, but there's a whole list of randomized controlled trials that show that PCIT has huge improvements in children's behavior among other outcomes um, and with lots of different populations. And as with all of that information, um, PCIT um, has been identified as an empirically supported treatment. And you know, there's, there's criteria for, for what makes that uh, distinction. Um, you know, in the 1990s, um, APA divisions 12 and 53 um, started to identify some of the evidence-based treatments or empirically supported treatments for kids um, and adults, um, and in the 2000s, that's when that kind of trickled down into mental health agencies, and they started saying, hey, this is the kind of stuff we need to be doing. We need to be doing things that we know work. Um, and fortunately, PCIT has been included in that movement, um, and we appreciate that. Um, and the, the dilemma comes in is, is once mental health agencies are saying, we need to be doing this, then there becomes that demand for Somebody needs to be there to teach people how to do it. Um, and what we uh, are really committed to is making sure that the, the, those therapists who want to be trained in PCIT get a good training in PCIT to be able to do it with fidelity um, and, and stick to the model because that's what we know works. And we want other PCIT therapists to have the wonderful experience with PCIT that we've had. And so we want to make sure that they are doing it the way that we know works. And so. Um, the uh, PCIT International has developed uh, specific training guidelines for what um, PCIT therapists need to do to be, um, to be trained. 
Um, the first thing is that um, to be considered for training, um, as a clinician, you need to be a master's level or higher um, clinician actively working with children or families. Um, the, the, um, there's also kind of a caveat for students. If you're a student and you're working towards um, uh, licensure, um, you're working towards um, your degree, um, but you're actively working and supervised by a licensed PCIT provider, that's also acceptable. Um, the, at the agency level, agency support is really important. Um, I wouldn't say it's impossible to do PCIT without agency support, but I wouldn't want to try it myself because it would be very, very tough. Just because of the, the requirements for PCIT um, are sometimes above and beyond what agencies consider general therapy requirements. And so being able to, to kind of push for those things. So we want to make sure that the, the agency um, serves clients in the appropriate, appropriate age range. Um, you know, training's not going to do you any good if you can't go back to your agency and do it. Um, you want to provide space and equipment necessary for PCIT. The agency should, should be on board with that. Um, and the agency also needs to be aware that it's going to take some time um, from, for the clinician to learn the, the model and learn it well. And so they need to be able to um, give that clinician that time to do that, both in terms of training and in terms of consultation. The didactic training component is 40 hours of face-to-face -face training with a certified trainer. There's master trainers identified um, that provide the training, um, and it covers the theory, the principles, the skills. There's a lot, a lot of rehearsal and role play and doing. Just like the treatment involves a lot of doing for the parents, the training involves a lot of doing for the therapist. Um, there's case observations, um, and then a lot of times the trainees are, are asked to um, meet mastery for the, uh, for the assessment, the DPEGs, for the CDI skills and the PDI skills. They should be able to do those things for themselves before training parents to do them, which makes sense. There should also be an advanced training two to six months later to really refine those coaching skills and, and address some advanced treatment issues. Once therapists have kind of gotten into PCIT, uh, it tends to be easier to discuss and easier to learn the to, to broaden those skills rather than trying to cover all that material in just one, one training. The case consultation is also extremely important. Um, and the consultation uh, goes on with the certified trainer through two completed cases. Um, and um, what we want there is that the, it can be by phone or it can be via video or uh, via tape review or things like that. But there should be some consistent feedback from the trainer on therapy cases so that it can, again, generalize not just from a hypothetical case but to an actual case. Um, and, and go through that way. Um, and we want uh, trainees to, to develop or to demonstrate some core competencies. They should be able to uh, do the CDI teaching didactic session. They should be able to do the PDI teaching didactic. They should be good coaches, um, both in CDI and PDI. Um, they should understand how to kind of run a session and what that looks like and how the interactions with families should go. Um, and of course, they need to be able to do all the measures. For more information on PCIT training, um, you can visit www.pcit.org. There's lots of information there. All of the master trainers are listed on the website. Um, training dates are often announced there, and there's contact information. Um, and uh, PCIT International is in the process of uh, certifying regional trainers as well. So we're expanding the number of trainers that are available so that we can um, provide um, more and more trainings to those who want to be trained. Now, this training will cover part of the didactic training, the 40-hour, um, the 40-hour didactic component. This training is designed to cover part of that, but not all of that. So, if you are interested in becoming a PCIT therapist, you would still need to seek out additional training, both in terms of workshop training, but also that case consultation. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Typically, what is the average age, uh, age range of the clients? We see kids that are generally between three and six years old. Yeah. We, we, we talk about preschoolers most of the time. Preschoolers, um, so three to six is usually.
pretty good. Yeah. How do you think it would affect the dynamics of the therapy if instead of having the one way mirror, like if the therapist was actually in the room with the therapist? Okay, the question is is how would PCIT be affected if the therapist was in the room rather than behind a one way mirror? I think that's a really good question. Um, there are some therapists that, you know, sometimes our equipment doesn't work and you, you have to go inside the room. Um, to be honest, I think it's more awkward. Um, but it can work. Um, you know, my goal is always to have a mirror and coach behind the mirror because I think that it, it, one, it removes some stimulation from the child. Some kids are really distracted by the therapist being in the room and that can make for a really challenging session. Other kids could care less that the therapist is in the room and it works out just fine in those situations. But um, we always strive for having the mirror and, and doing it behind the mirror. But if, if that isn't available, sometimes in the room can work out okay. I have yeah. a question related to that. Yeah. Uh, if you have to, go, you know, because according to what you were saying through the mirror, yeah. the parent has something on the ear and you provide the command in a way that the child can hear. Mm -hmm. It's like a direct feedback right there. Yeah. If you are in the room, do you direct feedback the parent? You know, when, when therapists are in the room, in general, they're providing less feedback to the parent because it's kind of weird. Um, you know, if the child hears you say, tell him he did a great job on that drawing, <laughs> you know, the, the child's going to be like, come on, mom, am I supposed to believe that? You know, so you have to be more careful in terms of what you can say or, or not say when the child can overhear. But I mean, we do try to, if we are doing it in room, to sit behind the parent and, and whisper and keep as much of it out of the child's perception as possible. That's why it's not ideal, though. That's why the mirror is really ideal. Yeah, you had a question. Yeah, um, you mentioned um, that part of the treatment or the sessions would include home visits, correct? I did not no? mention that, no. Okay. Would that be part of the post-treatment, or is that something that that is looked at? It, it, it's something that some therapists have, have done, uh, PCIT, that includes home visits, um, but it's not part of the standard protocol. There's so, guidelines or anything for that? There's not at this point. Uh, you know, after treatment, I think it would be up to the clinician's discretion. If they felt like that was something that was needed, um, that could certainly be done. Because there would be needed guidelines in order for home observations to take place, in order for it to fit within. Well, I think any home observations would be outside of the PCIT protocol. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Have you tried to adapt it to a little bit of a, an older population, like seven, eight, nine year old kids? Because the standard protocol is for three to six year olds, and honestly, it works best for three to six year olds. Um, lots of therapists have tried to use it with lots of different populations, and we'll be talking some about those. Um, as we go along, um, but what we're going to really be focusing on, on is the three to six year olds. Yes, sir. Yeah, I had a couple questions. Um, in in the sessions where it was, you were talking about the measures of like ten ten praises during uh, like as a, as a goal. Is that during a certain specific amount of time, like for like a? F you are going to be my best friend <laughs> because I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, um, and I'm going to answer that question and many more in terms of what we're looking at. It, it's during a five minute observation that we watch the parents. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are there specific behavioral uh, things that you target? Uh, is ADHD, oppositional defiant, which do you find it, it most effective uh, in treating, or is it just? Well, it, it really varies. Um, the, the targets, the most common populations for PCIT are going to be oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, ADHD. Um, those sorts, but we've—I mean—we've seen kids that have comorbid disorders, internalizing disorders, as well as externalizing disorders. Um, the wide gamut—you know—sometimes it's reactive attachment. Sometimes a three to six-year-old will have a diagnosis of bipolar. There's lots of different, you know, ways. Basically, what you know—it's—it's it's targeting disruptive behavior. If the kid is acting out, if they're aggressive, if they're defiant, if they're oppositional, um, if they're active, those are the sorts of things that we target. Yes. So the PCIT is best when there is a clearly identified disorder or some kind of diagnosis is made, or, may, uh, or is it just as applicable when, say, the, the parents are just having a hard time managing their child, maybe because they're very young and they both work or something like that? 
you know, in terms of the empirical support, we have the most empirical support for kids that have diagnoses because in research, you want to have, you know, your, your populations clearly identified. Um, clinically, though, I think that, you know, what we're doing in PCIT is we are training parents to be the authoritative parents like Balmer and identified that are the optimal kinds of parents. And so I think that any parent that, that needs help with their parenting skills can benefit from being high in warmth and high in limit setting. Um, so I'm, I am kind of a big fan of PCIT for those kinds of parents as well. Other questions? Yes. Um, you, uh, in the training, do you encourage both parents or, or, a sing or one parent? Or that's a great question. We want all the parents that we can have, that we can get. Um, I mean, we really do want both parents to be in, involved if at all possible. Um, and, and it's kind of taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Every family has different circumstances as far as that goes. If both mom and dad can be there, that's great. If mom and grandma are the primary caregivers, we want mom and grandma to be there. Um, I'm seeing a case now that's uh, aunt number one and aunt number two <laughs> who are the primary caregivers, and those are the ones that are involved in treatment. Um, so we really want who, whoever the primary caregivers are for the child to be involved. Um, and so um, that's important to us. That being said, sometimes moms will come in and say, you know, either dad has to work, he can't make it, or he's not really supportive of this. Um, I'm kind of doing it on my own. So we will proceed with just one parent if the other parent isn't willing to participate. Um, but sometimes we find that if we proceed with one parent, the other parent catches on that it's working and, and will participate a little bit farther down the road. So that's kind of nice too. Would you discourage more than two primary caregivers? You know, it gets a little complicated when you're when you have more than two primary caregivers, um, just because you have a limited amount of time in your session, and you want to make sure that everybody gets their individual coaching um, taking place. So, um, if there's more than three, which is you know a, a, a blessing in, in a way to have that many caring uh, adults for the child, um, again on a case by case basis, we might decide what the most logical, feasible arrangement of caregivers would be. And would you also have the same caregivers attend each of the therapy sessions? So like for example, if you have mom and grandma and then in another session mom and dad and another mom and aunt, would that be something you wouldn't encourage? Um, I like the same caregivers to come each week. Um, it definitely makes it easy. Um, you know, and that's the expectation. The expectation is that the caregivers that, that come come each week. Um, that being said, if I, you know, I've certainly had it where I'm expecting mom, and all of a sudden dad shows up instead, and I've never seen dad before, um, and we make it work. I mean, I, I think that as PCIT therapists, we try and be very welcoming. But the the general expectation that we set up with families is you will you will both come each week, or you will come each week. Yeah. Yeah. Would that be part of the? responses or the, the skills taught to the parent actually and being able to, um, uh, how do I say that, respond to that type of situation, meaning like where you have grandparents that maybe indulge their grandchildren and uh, take away from the actual progress that they're making? You know, we, we work with families on, on all the different barriers to treatment that might be going on or barriers to them doing this at home. Um, so if they have another adult in the house that is making it difficult for them, then we would, we would problem solve that with them as, much, as best we could. Limit setting means that um, telling the child what to do and expecting them to, to comply with that, um, or setting boundaries, like, you know, it's not okay to hit, and there's a consequence if you do hit. That's what I mean by limit setting.